So, so our, our next speaker is uh, Wes Pike from uh, Madison, and he's going to be talking about uh, the role of enhancers in uh, control of gene expression. Um, and Wes, uh, uh, for people who don't know him, is one of, one of the pioneers in um, understanding the regulation of uh, gene. I'm sorry, bone metabolism. Thanks, John. I, I really would like to thank the uh, members of the organizing committee for uh, inviting me here. I don't actually know who that was, uh, but I think it was John. I got an email at some, some late night uh, email asking whether I was available, which of course I said yes, because last year uh, I attended the meeting and, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here again. And I'm also happy to be in a session on common diseases because I will touch a little bit about, uh, on, on that uh, at the end of my talk. Um, so I would like to, um, <clears throat> let's see, I would like to uh, first acknowledge some of the people that have been involved in, in the work that I'm going to do, that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, Mark Meyer uh, in particular, who's here, Songman Lee, uh, Nancy Benkuski, and Melda Onal have been uh, integrally involved in some of the work that, that uh, we're going to talk about today. <coughs> uh, <coughs> now, I don't really need to show this slide uh, because you're all aware of enhancers and, and uh, the question is, what I would like to do is tell you a little bit about our enhancer work and specifically that involved in bone cell specific enhancers. Uh, but of course that raises the question of why one would want to study uh, these uh, interesting uh, regulatory regions of, of genes. And of course, I don't have to go through all this except to say that uh, enhancer governors govern, uh, certainly govern uh, cellular phenotyping through selective control of gene expression. And this, I think, is actually a, a rather daunting task because while we're talking about uh, cell selectivity and so forth uh, today, uh, there's at least 700, uh, there, there's at least uh, a couple of hundred cell types. Uh, in, in most organisms. And then there's also the transitions that occur within these uh, cell types as they undergo uh, differentiation. And there's also the environmental impact that's actually been showed, shown uh, w with regard to uh, epigenetic landscapes uh, with respect to the same type of, of uh, uh, cells, for example, macrophages uh, that uh, Chris Glass has shown and others have shown that could impact uh, what we see there. So there's some uh, major reasons why we should understand uh, these elements. And of course, the uh, single nucleotide variants and the SNPs uh, here in human disease are extremely important. But as was just mentioned, the context in which these SNPs or, uh, or uh, variants exist are primary determinants of how that SNP will actually behave regardless of whether it's uh, located in a binding site for a particular transcription factor or not. And then I also happen to think that uh, understanding enhancer properties are important for therapeutic development because uh, I do think that there's a, a unique specificity there with respect to the regulation of, of, of genes that may have therapeutic value. So um, everyone needs an entry point in terms of trying to uh, uh, understand how enhancers work. Uh, and that can certainly be evolution, it can be, uh, it can be uh, differentiation, uh, it can be disease, as we're talking about at this meeting uh, extensively. But also, uh, if you're going to study enhancers, you may be interested in systemic regulation of, of these regulatory elements by such uh, uh, hormonal uh, systems as the vitamin D system. And that's, of course, what we have used to uh, uh, to not only understand the vitamin D system itself, but also to get into uh, the regulation of, of, uh, of enhancers. Now, the, the focal point of the vitamin D system, of course, is the vitamin D receptor itself, which is a nuclear receptor. Uh, and following its cloning a number of years ago, uh, there was much work that, that uh, um, was accomplished to determine basically three principles. The first one was uh, to identify the motifs in which the vitamin D receptor interacted uh, here. The second was to, uh, to realize that the vitamin D receptor acted as a heterodimer in complex with another nuclear receptor uh, called RxR. And of course that uh, complex, RxR participates 
as a heterodimer partner for other nuclear receptors as well. So there's a, a, a incredible complexity involved in that. And then finally, we re actually really discovered, uh, perhaps to our disappointment, and this was a number of years ago, that really the function of the receptor was simply to provide, provide a, 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 a binding, a, redirect a binding site for uh, other co-regulatory uh, complexes that include uh, the epigenetic histone acetylation complexes, nucleosome remodeling complexes, and so forth. Uh, and this is just three of many that, that, have been, uh, that have been identified. Now, the problem with all those studies early on was the fact that um, that we, it was very receptor centric, and in fact, there was only a few genes that we could look at. So uh, a few years ago, we began to, uh, with the availability of new approaches, we began to look at, uh, use chip chip and then chip seek analysis to actually search for the, uh, uh, the vitamin D receptor cystrome and to understand where it was binding on, on uh, in various cell types. Uh, including, uh, including bone, which was a, a particularly interesting one. Uh, and so this is a study that we did in, in uh, bone cells. And one of the important aspects of this, we can isolate bone cells, grow them in culture, and we can actually also differentiate them. So we can actually look not only at the vitamin D receptor cystrome, that is the binding sites in what we're going to call POBs or pre-osteoblasts, or they can be, uh, oftentimes they can be MSCs, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, and we can actually look at the transition then when we differentiate them into uh, mature mineralizing uh, osteoblasts. And so we took these cells and uh, uh, basically treated them with either uh, vehicle or, or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which of course is the ligand for the vitamin D receptor, and then just did a, sip, a chip uh, uh, seek analysis of, of these cells. And the first thing you'll see here is that in the primary osteoblast, the, the, the precursor osteoblast, uh, there's a large dependency upon 125 for binding. So we get uh, about 1,000 binding sites in the absence of the hormone and about 7,000 in the presence. So very dependent for binding on, uh, uh, on the ligand itself, which is not actually true for a lot of the other nuclear receptors that, uh, that uh, are, are utilize RXR as their partner. Now, when we looked at the RXR uh, systrome, it was actually much larger than that for uh, for the for the uh, for the VDR, but the important point here was when we looked at the co-localization of the two, uh, about 60% of the uh, vitamin D receptor sites uh, co-localized with with RXR, suggesting, of course, that uh, or supporting the idea that in fact uh, this was truly a, a primary uh, function of the receptor was to uh, utilize RXR as a partner. And when we looked at the uh, response elements, we we looked at uh, a de novo uh, uh, examination of these binding sites, uh, the most common element that turned up was an AGGTCA uh, a duplex uh, separated by three base pairs. And this actually was pretty satisfying because this was the first, this was consistent with exactly the, the, the sequence that we identified in the first gene, and I won't tell you how many decades ago that was. But in any event, these were uh, then uh, features that uh, were consistent and validated those earlier studies. But as has been uh, talked about uh, today already and uh, was a surprise to us, we learned that in fact the, most of the binding sites uh, were not located promoter proximal but were in fact uh, uh, intronic and intergenic and could have been 10 to 100 kilobases away from the promoter itself. And this has major implications, has already been discussed in actually now identifying the, the sites of action of of uh, transcription factors because this is a general feature uh, and, the, and the target genes they regulate. This has actually created a big problem for everyone in the room who's studying uh, gene regulation. Now the final thing is, is the, uh, when we look at the osteoblast, the mature mineralizing osteoblast, what you can see here is a, an incredible down regulation of the cystrome for the vitamin D receptor, going from around 7,000 uh, binding sites down to about a uh, little bit less than, than 1,000. And this was actually uh, rather surprising uh, to some extent. So um, we were curious about whether there was a consequence to this. And so we actually did some uh, microarrays and some RNA sequencing analysis of uh, the precursors in the mature, mature osteoblasts. And you can see that there's a striking uh, decrease in the number of genes that are targeted from about 1,000 down to maybe around 
400 or so. So there was incredible down regulation distributed both in up uh, genes that were up regulated as well as down regulated. Now this actually wasn't entirely a surprise because we know that 125D3 is actually trophic for the vitamin D receptor and therefore in the absence of 125 D3, uh, the receptor actually decreases its expression over time as uh, these cells uh, actually mature. So this wasn't uh, uh, an incredible surprise, but what was a surprise actually was that we found uh, a, a collection of, of genes, actually a fairly large collection of, of those 400 genes, which showed differential target gene responsiveness to 125D3 that was entirely due to differentiation. And here's some examples here of the, of the, uh, of the comparison of expression and response to 125D3 and then the, uh, the uh, data tracks, the chip seek tracks, uh, for those individual genes uh, across, across those sites. So the first one would be CAL 2A1, which you can see is downregulated in precursor cells, but is relatively resistant to 125 action when the cells are actually mature. And I think it's not surprising if you look at the track down here, uh, there's a very strong vitamin D receptor binding peak right here, and in fact that's almost completely obliterated uh, when the cells are mature. So this pretty much accounts for at least some of the segment of genes that are down right, that are that are lost, the responsiveness is lost. However, if you look at ENPP1 and 3, these are mineralizing uh, regulators uh, involved in, uh, in uh, the osteoblast ability to mineralize uh, uh, their matrix, uh, you can see that in fact their responsiveness to vitamin D over time is actually increased during the differentiation process. And if you look at this, at this, uh, uh, at this locus, these are genes that are actually separated uh, or, or closely spaced, uh, <clears throat> and in fact, they're regulated by the same enhancer. But the surprise is that even though these are increased in responsiveness to the vitamin D hormone, uh, the, the, the amount of vitamin D receptor that's bound here is, is decreased by at least tenfold or more, um, and w which was a surprise. Finally, if you look at IGF-BP5, uh, you can see it's not responsive in earlier cells and then becomes responsive to vitamin D uh, as the cells are mature. Uh, and again, in the same, in the same way, uh, we've lost a lot of vitamin D receptor binding. Uh, uh, this is the uh, scale over here. So we've lost a lot of vitamin D receptor binding. And the real question here then is, is how do we sensitize these, these cells to uh, the effects of 125D3 even though the receptor is now dramatically down-regulated and his binding activity is not near as extensive. And there's two answers to this and they're not simple, but one is epigenetic and the other is transcription factor uh, activity uh, separate from that of the vitamin D receptor itself. So I don't have time to go through the epigenetic changes that are involved in, in differentiation. Uh, these two uh, 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 descriptors here are really uh, things that, that uh, are, are one of the great contributions uh, of the ENCODE project and it's something that we have, uh, have utilized extensively and I won't go through these but there are certainly signature histone modifications that are dynamic and, and uh, that are changed rather dramatically in response to differentiation. Uh, and they contribute to the responsivity to secondary regulators that certainly includes the vitamin D receptor and other signal regulated nuclear, uh, nuclear proteins. Uh, we also noticed that vitamin D actually can provoke changes in, in uh, histone modification, particularly acetylation, and this goes back to the, one of the uh, co-regulatory complexes that I talked about. So, the, the second part of it, however, is that there are transcription factors that are involved that are, that are localized to uh, many of these uh, regulatory uh, regions that, that bind the vitamin D receptor. We noticed, in fact, that if one looked at, um, uh, we had some hints that, that two master regulators of the osteoblast, RUNX2 and CEVP beta, might be, uh, might be uh, bound to uh, those sites that the vitamin D receptor and its partner, RXR, were bound to. And in fact, it turned out when we did a chip seek analysis, you can see about 40% of the vitamin D receptor binding sites actually have uh, both RUNX2 and CEPP beta. And the, uh, 
the uh, binding sites actually correlate uh, quite well. And in fact, what was most interesting about this was when we really looked at this, uh, there was a definite organization of these uh, binding sites where the vitamin D receptor was in the center uh, and RUNX2 and CEBP beta were uh, on either side of, of, this, of the binding activity for these. We call this a consolidated enhancer and we gave it the name osteoblast enhancer complex. Um, I, I'm sure that it probably works in other uh, cell types uh, besides the osteoblast, but certainly there was an organization here at the same, at a, at a specific enhancer there, there was uh, a, other proteins that were involved in potentiating or controlling the, regula the, the regulatory capability of the vitamin D receptor itself, and we think that that's uh, uh, not, uh, not unexpected and certainly interesting. So key features of these enhancers thus far, uh, distal binding site locations, you're all pretty familiar with this, modular features uh, where there are multiple transcription factors that can be bound, uh, epigenetic uh, enhancer signatures can be seen in these sites, and in fact uh, the most interesting is transcription factor systems are highly dynamic, not only in the differentiation which I've showed you, but clearly and we'll, I'm sure there'll be others that will be talking about this, uh, in, in differentiation, maturation, uh, and disease activation, and they have a, a major consequence on, on gene expression. So I want to touch on now just two more genes that uh, highlight some of the uh, additional features of, of enhancers that we, were dis that we discovered. The first one is MMP13, which is regulated by vitamin D and, and uh, during differentiation. Uh, it produces collagenase 3, which degrades extracellular collagens at skeletal sites in bone, but it also has very uh, 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 profound effects in cancer and in fibrosis and a variety of other areas. Uh, it's regulated by many things besides vitamin D, and the interesting thing about this is, is that all, all previous work on this gene has focused exclusively on uh, the promoter proximal region of MMP13, and this is true of so many genes now that when we, in, when, when we begin to study a, a, a gene, we try to ignore all the previous data that's been generated by standard luciferase assays uh, and transient transfection analysis because it's almost always wrong. Uh, so, you can see, <laughs> so you can see, and we contribute a little bit of that, although most of our stuff turned out to be uh, not unreasonable, but I, I like to say that it's either 5% right or completely wrong. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, you can see here, this is another gene in that collection where there's really very little regulation in the precursor cells, but uh, when you mature the cells, there's an increased sensitivity to 125D3. So here's the uh, uh, ChIP-seq analysis that, that looks at this locus. Uh, here's the MMP13 in this direction, and uh, uh, here's the promoter region. And uh, what we're looking at is both precursor cells and osteoblastic cells, and we're looking at a variety of different measures. And I think the first thing you can see that is that in addition to the promoter itself, uh, there are three different regions here at 10 kilobase, 20 kilobase, and 30 kilobase that suggest that they might be uh, enhancers. And interestingly, uh, this one binds the vitamin D receptor. The 10K binds the vitamin D receptor. The 20K tends to bind CEBP beta, and the uh, uh, more distal one at 30K seems to bind largely RUNX2, which is a master regulator. And so we were curious about this. Uh, if you look at these sites, they all align with, uh, certainly with H3K4 uh, monomethylation, but you can also see some examples here where uh, there's a difference between the precursor cells and the mature osteoblast, suggesting uh, that there may be some uh, differential activity and that correlates with uh, the expression as well, particularly down here with H3K36 uh, trimethylation. You can also see some valleys here that John John Stam has, uh, has highlighted and others have highlighted where uh, the binding activities uh, actually are lodged within the, within the valleys uh, that are associated with this thing. So to actually explore this uh, in more detail, we've used uh, uh, CRISPR analysis to uh, uh, CRISPR deletion gene editing methods. Uh, and in this particular case, we took these cells, the parental cells, and we made a variety of deletions using CRISPR. Um, and these are the deletions that we made. Uh, we did uh, delete a region around, uh, proximal to the promoter, but not including the promoter. We deleted the 10 kilobase region as well as the 30 kilobase region. We also knocked out the VDR and we also knocked out RUNX2. 
Uh, so we had a collection of daughter cell lines, and in addition to that, the beauty of CRISPR is that you can make sequential deletions uh, so that you can uh, examine the combinations, and we did that as well. Uh, and then we looked at these daughter cells for the activity of MMP13, both basally and in response to 125. Now these are 125D3. So these are the these are the data uh, uh, in in these individual uh, daughter cell lines. This is the parental cell line here, basal and 125 inducible. This is just a clonal uh, cell line that's as, a, as another control. And I'm not going to take you through all this uh, because it's uh, relatively. Uh, complicated here. This is the, ba the, the, the general activity. We just expanded the, uh, the axis in, in this, uh, uh, on this side. But what I want to show you now is that, in fact, when you delete the promoter, uh, the promoter proximal, proximal region right here, you do lose some basal activity of MMP13 expression, but you retain, uh, to a large extent, the 125D3 responsive induction. If you remove the 10K uh, enhancer, you'll see here that you get also get a reduction in, in the baseline expression of MMP13 transcripts. But interestingly, you lose the induction, as might be expected, you lose the induction by uh, 125D3, which you can see here has gone down. But in fact, now you get actually a suppression. And I'm going to talk about this in the next slide, uh, just a comment on what our hypothesis is. Finally, if you look at the 30K deletion, you can see you lose all basal activity uh, and almost all the 125D3 responsiveness. And if you look at the, G the transcription factor knockouts, you get the similar correlations. So these were uh, pretty interesting to us, and these data along with some other data that I don't have time to show uh, led to this uh, kind of not unexpected chromatin interaction model where we've centered the 30 kilobase enhancer um, and we have aligned it with the 20 kilobase, the 10 kilobase, and the promoter proximal region, uh, and largely because the 30K uh, uh, enhancer impacts where, which binds RUNCs, this master regulator, but not a, but not a, uh, a pioneering factor, uh, influences the activities of these other enhancer regions, and they then in turn uh, determine the, the output of the gene. And one of the additional experiments that we did was simply to see if we deleted the 30 kilobase enhancer, what happened to vitamin D receptor binding and, and uh, RUNCs binding to some of these other sites and CEBP beta binding activity. And it was almost completely obliterated when we removed this uh, distal 30 kilobase enhancer. So we think that this is very central, and we also would suggest that this uh, could be very complicated. For example, if you found a SNP uh, in this region, in this 30K enhancer that would affect the uh, binding activity of RUNCs and therefore impact the ability of this gene to be regulated by vitamin D, but you might search long and hard to find a vitamin D responsive region in this 30K uh, element because it's not there, it's over here. And so I think this has an impact on, on, on these ideas. Finally, just to address the repression, uh, the uh, the 125 D3 actually downregulates RUNCs expression, uh, and the dependency of this gene on RUNCs is extremely important. And so, if you downregulate uh, the RUNCs by uh, a secondary activity or a separate activity by 125 D3, we think that leads to something that looks like suppression. Now, I'm going to turn to this last uh, 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 gene, rank lig the rank ligand gene. Uh, and I'll go quickly through this. Um, rank ligand is, a, is an osteoclastogenic factor that uh, we know is involved in bone remodeling and, and certainly involved in, in, uh, in osteoporosis. Uh, but it's also involved in immune function. It's also involved in smooth muscle uh, activity. Uh, and we think it's involved in, in atherosclerosis as well. Um, and so we were interested in that. This is the gene, and you can see immediately we've looked at a variety of enhancer regions upstream of this particular gene. You can see there's at least there's at least ten different enhancers. Uh, these are the binding activities of, of various factors that we've looked at. I won't go through this in detail, but the key al elements here are that these these individual enhancers. Here's the the gene itself. Actually, is TNF uh, SF11. Uh, you can see that the, these enhancers actually are mediating largely mesenchymal or osteoblast lineage type cells. 
and uh, these actually are regulating uh, the uh, uh, expression uh, of rank ligand in the um, in T cells and B cells. So we knocked a, uh, we we went in and knocked out these five different enhancer regions, and we've uh, looked at the phenotype of of expression of rank ligand in these cells, and I won't go through all the details of this because it's uh, rather extensive, but the reality is that what we were able to learn from these is they have individual temporal, hormonal, and uh, tissue-specific uh, activities that are very important. So just in the last three slides, and I'll go th through this very quickly, um, we're, we've done a lot of other work, but we're, but we're actually interested in uh, the impact of rank ligand and the atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, and what we did then was cross the enhancer deleted mouse, the D5 enhancer deleted mouse, into the ApoE null mouse, uh, treated these animals then with a high fat diet and looked at the, uh, some of the features of this animal, um, phenotypic features uh, at, at 12 and, and 18 weeks. And the first thing you'll see is that rank ligand is upregulated in the atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, uh, but when you cross it with the D5, you can see a complete down regulation. Bone is affected as a control in, the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, these, uh, in these animals, and we get an induction of osteopetrosis uh, due to a down regulation of rank ligand. So when we looked at the atherosclerotic plaques by micro-CT and by histology, this is sort of the method. You can see the calcification that shows up in this in, this, in the aortic plaque, and this is a region that we're looking at, uh, one can actually quantitate the plaque size as well as the, uh, uh, as well as the uh, cal degree of calcification. And this is a summary of that experiment. Uh, these are the, the, the visual aspects of it. This is the histology. But at 12 weeks, what we see was that in the APOE animal, the single mutation, most of the animals developed uh, calcification. However, in the, uh, in the APOE uh, D5 double null, where we deleted or we reduced the expression of rank ligand, only one of the animals out of eight actually developed calcification, although this was lost in the, uh, at by 18 weeks. So the conclusion here is that rank ligand plays a significant role in the atherosclerotic plaque calcification, perhaps by promoting bone formation, which uh, if, if you uh, uh, notice the bone activity, rank ligand is a bone resorber uh, on, on bone, but in fact it may promote bone formation. This is the last slide, so I, I won't go through this uh, in any detail because I'm out of time, but uh, this is just a list of all the different uh, uh, aspects that we've learned from some of these studies, and uh, uh, we would anticipate that these would be the kinds of things that one would have to do uh, after we after we learn bioinformatically how to link enhancers to uh, the genes that they regulate. Thank you very much. So nice work. So I'm wondering about the deletion of the 10K, the 10KV uh, enhancer at the MMP9 locus. When you do the CRISPR deletion of that region, your results tend to suggest that um, you completely lose the regulation of MMP9. So I, I was wondering if you've actually assessed whether the 3D structure was completely disrupted by the deletion of that element, and or if you could specifically just delete the VDR element, or the RXR component, to actually just specifically target the binding of those factors to minimize any potential impact that there would be in the CRISPR deletion that would influence the 3D structure of that regulatory unit. Yeah, so, so we, had, we wanted to go in and, in, in, in essence, a gross way to look at it, but that was also the reason why we knocked out the vitamin D receptor itself. So I didn't talk about that. Uh, the, the data were there, but I didn't talk about that. But basically, when you do that, then you do get a very specific uh, response that's dependent upon the receptor for MMP13. The problem with that experiment, or not the problem, but the consequence of that is that the vitamin D receptor regulates other genes, and RUNX actually, if you knock it out, actually has a profound effect on the differentiation process itself. But in essence, you get the same kind of data when you do the combination. We would probably go back in and, and, and make the mutation, and you're right, that would isolate uh, the, the vitamin D effect specifically.
that happens in different three-dimensional contexts of the information or at different temporal times, I guess I clearly can't align with that equation. Well, so, yeah, so, so those, those kinds of studies that are, are being done and have been done, uh, the vitamin D, the, the, the ligand binding site is actually buried within the receptor itself. And so once the, the ligand gets in, this is sort of standard nuclear receptor uh, uh, sort of study, is basically it's buried there and it rearranges the receptor and it actually opens up a binding site, an LXXLL motif uh, uh, interaction uh, that w will facilitate interaction of, of, of co-regulators. Uh, and there, there are a number of them. It can't, they can't bind all of them at the same time, clearly. So we don't really know much about the dynamics of which are where, when, and how. So you're probably right that there's a, there may be some sequential. First of all, there's probably selectivity at individual enhancers that may, have, may convey unique activities out of that uh, particular complex as it's bound to DNA. There's, it's very possible, but I don't believe that there are studies that really have now looked at that yet. So. So that uh, 